Recording in progress. Good morning, students. Welcome to week two of organizational communications. So this second week, we're going to be looking at the history of organizational communications as a whole. And in order to do that, we're going to need to go all the way back and discuss something known as the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution happened um, after we were, as a nation, in what was an agricultural culture. We were farmers. We were ranchers. Um, we raised animals and we planted uh, vineyards and crops and things like that. And then, as we began to grow as a nation, um, things began to expand. They began to change. Uh, one example of that would be the railway, the railroad system. So as railways were built and extended across the country, that changed the whole picture of what you could sell and where you could sell it, where you could distribute it, and as a customer, where you could get it from. And the Industrial Revolution was made up about machinery. Uh, you had machines being built so that they could make machines. Look at the automobile industry that happened in the early 1900s when Ford and other automobile makers began to create these vehicles uh, so that we could, you know, travel faster and uh, and save our animals uh, and so on and even have covering over our heads as we travel. And um so as industry began to expand, that created a revolution of how things were done, and that meant machines. So when we're looking at the first metaphors, the first images or pictures of how organizations that were expanding from the, remember we talked about Sally having one hot dog stand, and then as it was successful, she had 20 hot dog stands. Well, Expand that out in your thinking to the um, railway industry. And as, you know, travel was happening and mass production of supplies and the demand for those supplies, particularly out in the Western United States, as people were, were moving, uh, began to change things. And um, so it makes sense that the first metaphors that were being developed for how to communicate and cause efficiency and effectiveness within any organization uh, was about machines, okay? So I'm gonna share my screen here now, and uh, we're gonna start looking at these examples. So they're known as the classical approaches to organizational communications. And uh, so this very uh, onset, we're gonna be looking at uh, specifically four factors that make up this week two lecture. Your textbook covers a lot of other things um, rather than just simply repeating what the textbook is doing. I'm going to give you some of the nuggets from the textbook, but bring in some other thought with it as well. Um, the machine metaphor, as we're talking about, uh, was really enhanced in the early 1900s by a Frenchman and his name was Henry Fayol, F-A-Y-O-L. Uh, his theory is mentioned in your textbook, and it's known as classical management. We're also going to look at Max Weber's theory of bureaucracy, and we're going to look at Frederick Taylor's theory of scientific management, okay? So let's go to our next slide. Organizations as machines. There are three primary components or ingredients, if you will, that make up the metaphor of an organization being a machine. That is that organizations are specialized. So you'll see that in here in this machine, that uh, the mechanics and gears here of a machine, they're specialized. Uh, they're also standardized, and they're also designed to be predictable. Okay, well, let's unpack that a little bit. Organizations are organized and operate in the hopes of being a well-oiled machine that just, it, it, you, you start it up again like a car and you just want it to run, right? When you and I get in our cars, we don't, you know, we're expecting these three things to happen. We want there to be a standardization, 
when we get in one car to another, we don't want to have to wonder, okay, where do I put the key in the ignition? And even the newer vehicles now, you just push a button and hold your foot on the brake and it starts. But you want it to be somewhat standardized of where you're going to find that at, right? Um, the same thing with putting on your parking brake or the switches that are going to be for your turn signals or something like that. Um, you want there to be some kind of standardization. It's going to vary from one automobile to another, but you don't want to have to reach underneath the seat to turn your windshield wiper on, right? The second thing is uh, the predictability of an organization. And these aren't in any particular order. These are simply the three primary ingredients. The predictability in the design and the operation of that organization. And this is where it comes into play that even the employees, the people themselves um, are seen as parts. They're seen as gears. So on this uh, little gear uh, design that you see here on your screen, you could put in managers, employees, and uh, and owners, or you could put in, you know, the different components that would make up. You could put in the general manager, the store manager, and the assistant store manager, um, depending on the type of organization that we're talking about. So there is a predictability to it. If a uh, car breaks down, we're going to take it to somebody that knows there are predictable concerns that could cause certain things in your car to stop running. So that's why the mechanic is going to ask you certain questions. And based off of our responses to those questions, they're going to start to predict, right, what might be wrong and how they can go about fixing this machine. Now, you could apply that to your, to your lawnmower, to your iPhone, whatever it might be. That you want there to be a predictability about how it operates and how it could be repaired if it's not operating the way you hope it would. So as parts of machine, people can be interchanged and even replaced. Um, you will often get told in an organization that operates much like a machine that, you know, you can be replaced easily. You know, there's 50 people that have an application that would like to have your job. Uh, you may have heard that. You may have said that. I don't know. Um, organizations as machines are very much operated off of a top-down approach, and we'll get to that. It's vertical. So the communication is mostly downward. The supervisor communicating to the employees, this is what we're going to do. And then some communication back from the employee back to the supervisor. But um, it's top down in how it's designed and how it is operated. Uh, the military would be a great example of an, an organization operating a machine. You know exactly what you're supposed to do, and you know who you report to. And your direct command is exactly who you listen to, unless their supervisor comes in and changes your immediate supervisor's instructions. Um, everybody didn't sit down and talk about how they feel about their job assignment. Uh, you may or may not have permission to do that, depending on the setting. But for the most part, you're given tasks, you're given assignments, you're given a clear description of what you're supposed to do, and you're expected to go out and perform it in an effective and efficient way. Okay. This is in and out This is my favorite place to go get a hamburger. And the metaphor of a machine is a great picture of why in and out is successful um, in and out as you see, you've got all these workers and they, each one of them is doing something specific. What you don't see is them all running around like, what am I supposed to do? What station am I supposed to work at? How do I go about uh, doing this job? Even if someone is brought in new, they will stand right next to somebody and they will be coached and mentored about how to do that specialized specific job. Okay, so at in and out in this kitchen, we see specialization. Notice that each machine and each location is in a specialized, specific location. And each person doing that, rather than running around frantically, they know exactly where they're supposed to be because it's been specialized. The person standing there that is that are making the French fries 
and cutting the potatoes. That's what they're doing. I mean, those people have to be in incredible shape to be doing that all day long. And then it's also standardized. When you and I go to an in and out whether it be in Southern California or in Oregon, we're going in there and we're expecting that if we get an in and out burger and an in and out shake and in and out fries, that they're going to taste very similar, that they're going to be delicious, that they're going to be hot, that we want us we want standardization on the cost and we want standardization on the quality of the product. Nothing more frustrating than getting a hamburger and it's cold and your French fries are cold when you went through the drive-thru, right? So we expect certain things to be standardized. And because of that, we want them to be predictable, right? So when organizations are well-maintained machines, we will often hear the term well-oiled machines. The machine organizations are rational and they're logical and they are designed to operate faster, more efficiently, and more effectively. And when any part of that isn't working, then they can come in in a predictable way and say, okay, where do we think it's broke down? Where in our machine, where in our approach to this, what gear needs to be either replaced or repaired? Uh, and the parts of the machine, again, as I said, people are interchangeable. So. Any one of these people in this kitchen probably have been cross-trained to do other jobs. Somebody calls in sick. We don't want to say, hey, there's only one person in all of In-N-Out uh, that knows how to pull that potato uh, cutter. Uh, we want to be cross-trained. We want people to know how to do the different jobs, uh, whether it be the customer service side or the cooking side, right? And... Uh, then it's also designed where it is top-down managed. So you're going to have owners, right? The owners of In-N-Out are doing quite well. Uh, they're not going to be broke anytime soon. And then you've got general managers that would oversee an area of a group of In-N-Out. Then you would have a store manager. Then you would have assistant managers and or shift managers. And then you would have employees. And uh, so you see this, there's a very hierarchical approach to how it is designed. It is top down. And as I said, the, the uh, military would be another good example of that. Now, there's two types of communication in any organization. And there you've got vertical, vertical and horizontal. Vertical means it is a supervisor and a subordinate that are communicating in some way. And then you've got horizontal communication. Those are the people that are doing similar jobs, usually have the same amount of authority or limitations to authority, and they're expected to work in collaboration. Okay, again, this is the machine metaphor, not necessarily a contemporary approach, but there are still a lot of organizations that operate this way. So you've got horizontal and you've got vertical. Usually the horizontal communication is happening with people that are at the same level within the organization. Similar role, similar assignment, similar role, similar pay, similar benefits, so on and so on. So uh, we've got that. Now let's go to uh, Henry Fail. I mentioned his name a little while ago, and he's known to be the father of the classic management theory. Uh, and he believes that there are five elements to successful organizational management. And he sees these five elements as being the things that answer the what questions to organizing. Okay. So the first one is planning. So he believes that organizations should plan. And what are you planning? You're planning for a future focus. How can we be better at what we're going to do? All right. And then you've got the organizing component. And so now we're saying, okay, we're going to plan something, but we're not going to get anywhere if we don't start to organize it. You know, we've got, we've got to put together job descriptions, job design. Um, what is going to be necessary in order for us to have an organization that is going to accomplish what we planned, right? Then the next thing is who's in charge? Uh, what's our chain of command? How are we going to know who reports to who? And how are we going to know if it got done? Um, you know, we don't want a situation where 
nobody is actually responsible to see whether or not all the employees showed up for work that day so that each one of the workstations is manned and taken care of. Let me give you an example. Right now in the California school system, which is where I live, um, the central California area is uh, very much comprised of a serious need for teachers. Um, when COVID happened, a lot of teachers either got sick um, and stayed home or they were told to stay home, depending on the school district. Um, and then some of them were very concerned about coming back into the classroom and being exposed again, maybe for themselves or for someone in their household. And so substitute teachers are a serious need right now. Well, the machine of the school, they're still going to have school the next day. But if they don't have enough teachers there, then somebody has to be paying attention. Did Mrs. Smith show up to work today and is going to be te teaching English Composition 101 in room 25? If she's not there, we need to know that. Okay. So that would be the command. Who's in charge? And then the coordination would be, how are we going to create and design the actual activities that people are going to do? So it's also known as the division of labor. And we're going to coordinate that so that there is uh, a systematic approach to what we're going to do. And then the control factor is ensuring that we're going to continue to maintain ourselves, right? We want to still be open for business, if you will, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, okay? So each one of those uh, answers a what question. So as an example, the planning would be, let's focus on the future direction of where we want to go and what we want to achieve. The organizing side would say, let's determine who's going to do what and how we're going to evaluate the results. The command would be supervisors being set in place to make sure that the organizational goals are met by the employees that they hire. And then the coordination would be, let's create some harmony in the workplace uh, so that we can all do this together as a team and uh, accomplish our business and also, again, ensuring that uh, the control part of it, again, is making sure we're still in business a year and five years from now. As many of you are aware of, there's so many industries that different businesses at different levels and different uh, types of careers are just going away right now because many companies or organizations, even if it's nonprofit, didn't make it uh, through the COVID era. And even as we're moving into the turn of the next year. Um, and so these factors, these five elements are a big deal in creating the what of what an organization is going to do. Okay. And again, these were designed by Henry Fayol. Now, these are the principles. So let me back up again. These five elements, right? The answer to the what questions now. He has the principles. So these are the principles for organizational management. And he has four primary principles that he applies here. The first one is structure. You'll see that at the top. Uh, structure is how we're going to design this thing, right? So structure would be very much about the hierarchical design, as we've been talking about. Whose accounts to who? who answers to who, so that we can know not only what's going to happen, but how it's going to get done, okay? Again, I'll use the military as a great example of the metaphor of an organization as a machine. There's a structure there. Uh, there are even titles that are very specific in that structure. Uh, thinking of the Army as an example, you've got generals, you've got colonels, you've got majors, you've got captains, and so on down. And as soon as you talk to somebody that's in the army, uh, either they'll bring it up or you can ask them, you know, what are you? And usually they'll tell you what their rank is. And so it's determined how much authority, how much responsibility, how many people that they're responsible for. And uh, what is their assignment? Okay. And then they'll start t telling you what division they're in, whether are they in the the cavalry, modern day cavalry division, which would be helicopters and things, are are they uh, a mechanic that works on tank? 
what is it that they do specifically, okay? So that's the structure. Then we're looking at uh, the power. And the power in Fayol's approach is based off of centralizing authority. So everybody doesn't have the same responsibilities and everybody doesn't have the same authority. It's centralized um, in the military. Again, you're going to see a tent somewhere. If it's out in the middle of uh, the battlefield, uh, you know, or out in, uh, you know, whatever nation, you're going to see these tents and structures that are built up. And there's going to be a tent where the commander is there. Uh, and that's the centralized command station. Okay. And then you've also got uh, rewards. Uh, I'm sorry, you've got power. And so let's look at the power. I've got my notes over here on the side that I'm going through while we're talking. Uh, that's the power side. So it's centralized. Uh, authority and responsibility are designed to be made clear who accounts to who. Then you've got the rewards. And these are the salaries and the benefits. It's the compensation, if you will, uh, for what managers and employees are going to be thanked and appreciated and uh at this point right now in the classical designs and approaches we're looking at you can just go ahead and assume right now we're talking about the compensation being tangible um it is about you know the pay it's about insurance it's about those kinds of things um and then fourthly is the attitude uh, Fail really believed that attitude was going to be a big component to any organization being successful. And so uh, there's subordination. In other words, uh, it's these kind of things. The needs and interests of the whole of the organization take higher priority than the needs of the individual. Okay. That, again, is part of that machine structure. Uh, going back to in and out, if you have somebody that didn't show up to work that is the one that's supposed to pull the potatoes they're not going to shut the whole machine down and put a sign out that says, hey, you know, the guy that cut some potatoes didn't come to work today, so we're not doing any French fries. No, they're going to find out, you know, who else is going to be playing that role that day. But the, the, the show will go on. The machine will keep going on. And then the second component to attitude is that Everything that we do should be in the best interests of the organization while you're at work. Uh, that and that only makes sense, you know. If you're if you're being paid to do a job, then it's realistic to have an expectation that the person is going to get that job when they're at work and they're going to stay focused on it, uh, rather than uh, doing something that uh, doesn't apply to what they're being paid to do. And then the third one is esprit de corps, which basically means all for one and one for all. Uh, the three musketeer movies uh, bring that to about uh, modern day. I would say it's more like this. We're all in this together. So let's work together to get it done. That would be a lot like uh, a sports team. The athletes on a sports team would say something like that before they would go out and compete. All right. Now what you see here is a hierarchical org chart. So you can see it's designed to be top down. So uh, let's think of a grocery store as an example. You've got a general manager and above them, you would even have a regional manager, right? But over that specific uh, store, you would have a general manager and then you would have a store manager. Uh, many times these would be multiple assistant managers, okay? And sometimes then you would have shift managers that would be subordinate underneath that. Then you've got the checkers. You've got the deli department. You've got the bakery department. And depending on the grocery store uh, that you're in, you could also have um, uh, a butcher department. You could have a pharmacy department, um, floral department in many grocery stores. And so every one of these departments will probably have a ship supervisor. And then you have the employees that are subordinate to them that are working in these different roles. So we know this uh, common knowledge of this and terminology is this is known as a chain of command. Okay. But again, notice the design from the classic models. It is top down. It is not horizontal leadership designed from front to back, so to speak. It's designed in a hierarchy. 
Okay. All right. Let's keep going here. Now we're going to get to uh, Max Weber's theory. And Max Weber had a theory about organizing based off of bureaucracy. So he had these uh, components that you're going to see here. He believed, again, that there should be a clearly defined chain of command. Who's responsible to who? Then you've got a division of labor. So again, I'm going to use the military as a great example of this. Uh, the division of labor. Who's going to do what kind of job? So you might have the tank division. Got the cavalry division. You've got the infantry. Uh, you've got the artillery division uh, of the army. Okay. So every one of them are divided up into a large group of employees that have similar assignments. And then they will be cross-trained within those types of jobs that would relate to one another. Then there's a centralization of power. Uh, you might have a colonel or a major or a captain that might be out in a certain field with the artill artillery uh, division. And you might have someone of a different rank over in another part of it. But it's clear who we're answering to and what we're here to do um, as a division of labor. And we know what that chain of command is, that the, the power is being centralized. And that also means the authority and the responsibilities um, are part of that centralization of power. Um, then inside of it, you've got closed systems. And I really think your textbook uh, does a really good job of designing this and talking about this. So thinking about a doctor's office, uh, your textbook refers to. So Catherine Miller and her writings for this did a great job of communicating that when you go to the doctor's office, you don't want to get a checkup in front of everybody in the lobby, right? <laughs> uh, now, if you're, you know, if you have a big, strong, confident sense of humor, you might think that that would be hilarious, but most people would not want to get a checkup from the doctor um, out in the lobby. So there's a reason why we have these different kinds of closed systems when you go to the doctor's office. There's a reason why the lobby is just that. It's the lobby. It's the waiting room. And then you've got the clerical workers who are uh, determining the appointments, either predetermined appointment or a walk-in appointment. And you have to come into a certain place and check in at the desk. Well, that's another closed system. Okay. Then you, depending on your doctor's office, my doctor's office also has a lab department. Well, that's a closed system over there as well. And then you go back to the doctor's actual offices that they have up and down the hallways, and there's another closed system. Usually you go in there and you sit down and it's either a nurse or a medical assistant that begins to ask you a series of questions while they're sitting at a computer. But you're in a private room. You have a very specific specialized uh, design to how the room is laid out. Uh, most doctor's offices have real, real similar layout, right? And uh, and we even know what chair is for which person when you come in there. So it's a closed system, okay? Multiple closed systems within the organization help it be organized. And then you've got the importance of rules and roles. Um, what are the rules? Uh, even when you come into the doctor's office nowadays, it might be you need to have a mask on. There might be somebody standing there that asks you a series of questions of have you been sick in the last few days, right? Um, and they'll let you know, uh, wait, uh, you'll see a sign that'll let you know, we'll call your name when it's time for you to go back there, right? Nobody walks into the lobby at the doctor's office and then just goes straight over, opens the door and goes back in there and says, hey, where's the doctor at? I'm going to sit down, right? So it's important in order to be organized that there are a set of rules and procedures that we go by. And then lastly, among these six facets is the functionality of authority. Um, who's doing what? How are we going to uh, operate uh, this machine that we know as our organization? Uh, and so it is uh, legitimate and traditional authority is based on a higher up hierarchy, a chain of command with the, the more authority one has, the higher up the chain of command they are, right? And then you've also got 
uh, charismatic authority. Uh, and that means that one's authority is based on one's ability, one's personality that is not easily duplicated. But I want to say we're starting to steer in a little bit of some of the more contemporary approaches to uh, uh, organizational leadership and management. But again, these designs are all uh, functioning as part of Max Weber's idea of what would make a well-oiled machine that is running effectively and efficiently to meet the organization's goals. All right. And now we're finally to Frederick Taylor's theory. And his theory is known as scientific management. And uh, it's actually uh, one of the best ways uh, that, you know, uh, it's based off, I should say, it's based off of saying there is a best way to do something. Um, so let's find out what the best way to do it. And so the research, the science behind it, is that if we're, and the textbooks used as a bricklayer as an example, but I would say that uh, maybe somebody is uh, brought into the bakery department at Costco, and now they're going to be taught how to make rolls. And they're going to be taught how to make cakes and uh, all of the different, you know, bakery goods that come in there. And they have already figured out how to do it. Um, now let's move over to uh, the rotisserie chickens at Costco. One of my wife and I's favorite because of the quality and the price. And uh, they have it down to a science. Have you ever watched the guys or gals? that run those rotisserie machines that when the chickens are finally done and they begin to take them off and they have all the containers laid out and they will take those long spikes that have multiple whole chickens on each one of those and they will run them across there and lay them out. And so they have developed best practices. What's the best, most effective and efficient way for us to make these chickens? Well, I would say because they do it so well on their effectiveness and their efficiency, having designed it off of best practices, that's why you and I can go get a chicken for the price that we can at Costco, um, is because they have brought the overhead down by them being able to mass produce a high quality product. Okay. So he has these uh, components, these four primary components uh, that Frederick Taylor has designed. And the first one is there's a best way to do something. So that's best practices. The second one is the selection of the right employees. So I'm going to use a term called fit. And you're going to see it a lot later. Um, you're going to also see it when you take your human resource management course. You're going to really get into the subject of organizational fit for the individual and the organization. But interestingly enough, way back when, uh, Frederick Taylor really believed that that was an important concept, was to have fit. Let's get the right people doing the right job. If somebody, uh, I'll use an example of a, a restaurant. If you have somebody that's really, really good at being a cook and somebody else is really, really good with people, but not so much of a cook, and the cook is a fantastic cook, but maybe he or she is a little bit even on the grumpy side. They're an artist. They want to be left alone. It probably would be better to put the cook in the kitchen and have he or she be the chef. And the person that really likes people, have them out there either waiting tables or greeting, but they're interacting with the customers that are coming in and out of the store, answering the phone calls. Uh, making sure that the takeout orders are done in an efficient manner and thanking the customers for coming in, right? So put the best people in the best role. All right. Then the third factor is to train everybody. Makes sense, right? We've got the best practices. Now we've got the best people in the right roles. Now let's give them the training that they need. That's the third factor. And then fourthly, Again, it's based off of hierarchy. Let's not have confusion about who's responsible for what. Um, if you've got a manager of the whole restaurant, they're going to determine who's running the kitchen, and they're going to determine who's reporting, who is in charge of who the uh, waiters are going to report to. 
so that if there's any conflict going on inside of the organization, we know who answers to who and who's going to make the final decision about what comes out. All right. And so you've got the managers and the laborers. And so um, Taylor really believed that that line needed to be really clear. Managers do the thinking <laughs> and laborers do the doing. All right. Now, let's just review a little bit here in summary. The classic approaches to business organizing is by three factors. First of all, creating specialized roles. Secondly, by standardizing those roles and all the other operations in the company. And remember in the middle of this, we realize that people are parts of the machine and therefore they can easily be replaced. Then thirdly, creating and maintaining predictability. We talked about in and out. We want predictability. And I would say that's the case with most products that we buy. Um, if we're going to buy shampoo from the same brand, uh, we want it to be the same product quality, whether I buy it from Safeway or Target, right? And uh, then lastly, like any well-oiled machine, we have to remember that the whole point of the machine design is that the machine must go on. You might have even felt the positive or negative effects of realizing that um, even if one person in an organization, uh, you know, isn't at their best or they're sick, uh, maybe they've had surgery and they're going to be out of work. The whole organization doesn't shut down because that one person isn't there. Uh, someone steps up, if you will, and takes their role either permanently or temporarily until they're back. All right. All right. Well, students, let me pray for you. I'm going to end our. Uh... There we go. Let me pray for you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this group of students. Thank you for the effort that they're putting into this course, the important concepts that they are learning and being able to apply in their personal lives and in their work life. And uh, once again, I just thank you for the privilege to be able to be a part of this uh, continuum and uh, give them what they need, Lord Jesus, this second week. Give them what they need. Give them the energy. Give them the support. Give them the time. Uh, give them the encouragement from others and from you. And so, students, I certainly want you to know I'm in your corner. I'm cheering for you. Um, as you will see written in the material Call me, text me. I'm here. I'm available. I want to help you, not just pass, but I want to help you learn the concepts and really be able to apply them. And I would like to hear stories from your careers as you move forward over the years uh, and uh, feel like I got to be a part of your life and the ministry of your life in some way or another. Okay. Uh, appreciate all of you and uh, have a great week. Bless you. We'll see you online.